All right. I'm, so I'm Dakota. Uh, I'm a geospatial developer for the Cleveland Metro Parks, but I also, we, uh, me and Stephen Mather, who may pro you probably know, he's more active in this community. Um, we have, he started and we've been building Open Drone Map for the past uh, five-ish years. That works. That works for me if it works for you guys. Um, uh, so you can find both of us on Twitter. Um, and I'll explain what Open Drone Map is. Thanks to Telenap for giving, me, giving us uh, another drone to add to the Cleveland Metro Parks fleet. I'll be using this as a prop. Uh, how do I get this to go next? I can't find my cursor. There we go. OK, so uh, what is Open Drone Map? Um, in, in a short sentence, uh, it's an open source toolkit for processing aerial drone imagery. Um, and what that means is uh, it's modern photogrammetry uh, in the sense that uh, it's for a modern technology uh, that is drones uh, and other low altitude aerial image collection, balloons, kites, uh, what have you. Um, it does fully automated uh, image matching, digital surface modeling, uh, and mosaicing. Uh, in preparation for the robot takeover. Uh, <laughs> um, so what, what are we looking at in the future uh, in society? Uh, are we looking at something like this, uh, or like this, maybe, uh, or, or like this, um, maybe? I think something probably, we saw some talks about uh, uh, automated vehicles, uh, so maybe it'll look something like this. It's looking a little slow, but uh, complete organized chaos, maybe, to some. Uh, this is already happening. <laughs> uh, as crazy as it might sound, but um, what, what is this sort of, what people are thinking about in the future? What is this enabled technology-wise? It's enabled uh, really high-tech sensors um, for automated cars, and that applies also to drones. Uh, they can go in a flight like this and do some cool stuff and know where they are and have GPS and sensors and, uh, and take photos um, and build a sense of the world. Uh, so like I said, uh, Open Drone Map is an open source toolkit for processing what drones can do. Uh, and where does that start? Well, computer vision. Uh, and photogrammetry, it's sort of a, a blend of the two. Um, so how do we get enabled computers to navigate and understand the world? Uh, and uh, what does that depend on? It depends on stereo vision, much like we do. Uh, we have two eyes, we can see in 3D because we have two eyes, and so that's uh, one of the uh, core concepts in uh, Open Drone Map in developing the 3D space, uh, which can create our, our maps. Um, uh, and you've already seen from Nate's talk, I'm not going to go over this too much, uh, how drones can be used uh, and how uh, drone mapping specifically can be used. So I'm not going to go over that too much, but uh, ecology, vegetation mapping, invasive species monitoring, um, uh, habitat mapping, stuff like that, humanitarian response, of course, um, and in the case of open aerial map, participation, uh, particip particip participatory creation for, of data for the public good. Um, so what does open drone map? Do? How does it work? Uh, it's, there's a lot of jargon on here, and I'll, I'll go through it step by step. Um, but uh, like I said, it's a, it's a process. It's a, it's a pipeline almost. Um, it starts with structure from motion, which is a, a, I'll explain it when I get to that. <laughs> um, but basically, it's, it's matching images together uh, using the motion of the drone. Uh, and creates a, sort of a sparse point cloud of, of tie points that tie in all the images and the cameras together. Uh, and then we densify that. We and to create a very heavily dense point cloud, three-dimensional point cloud. Uh, and then we can uh, do a surface reconstruction, texture over that surface, and then build an orthophoto, uh, a, a mosaic to orthophoto from that textured surface. Uh, so for structure of motion, uh, we've got our drone. Uh, this is actually taken from a kite, so I'm, I'm going to lie a little bit here. But the drone goes over, image one takes a picture, image two takes a picture. They're similar spaces, but they're different. They're different. 
um, because they're from different angles or, or what have you. So even though those two images might look similar, they are uh, two points in time. Uh, and then you can find points, features, uh, you know, and, and this is where the computer vision comes into play. Uh, the computer is actually um, looking for unique identifiers in the image uh, and in each image and then matching those together. And that's what Structure for Motion does. And we use, uh, thanks to Mapillary, they have uh, a, a Structure for Motion software that they've released open source uh, uh, and it's really great. Um, and then, so you, you get all these points and it all, there's a, here's a photo of, of this sparse point cloud and it looks actually pretty good. You could kind of understand what's going on in there. Uh, there's like a road and a, and a parking lot and maybe a building and lots of trees. Um, so then we have to densify that. We have to actually make that uh, more of a understandable uh, three-dimensional space. Um, and there's some algorithms, I'm not gonna go into them, uh, but then we get another set, uh, point cloud, and this is just a picture of it, where you can actually really tell what's going on in that. And this is just points, this isn't, you know, this is just points, uh, and I, I don't actually know what the, the, the density of this is, but um, the next step in the process is to take those points and turn it into a surface uh, that we can texture over. Uh, so we use a Poisson uh, triangulation method that's available on, in the point cloud library, and we create something that looks a little bit like this. Uh, this is the same uh, area as before. Um, and you can see now that there's a little bit more of a surface there, although it's not textured, it has no uh, color values to it. It's just faces, and if you look in closer, um, you can see, yeah, it, it throws away a lot of, uh, some of that detail as well, and we're working on that. Uh, so next step to texture that, this is the 3D mesh, it's now had some images uh, overlaid, and it uses some, um, some algorithms to determine which image is the best for which area, for which face of the, of the mesh, uh, and then it mosaics and, color, and does color blending uh, and makes sure that it's all uh, an even color on the global and local scale. Uh, and then finally, the most important part for many, many people uh, is generating uh, a orthorectified mosaic. So questions you may, may be asking is, this is great, Dakota. Uh, how do I get started in collecting the necessary data? That's for the robot takeover. Uh, so yeah, you gotta get a drone. Uh, you gotta fly, you gotta get a drone that can do automated flights because you have to be able to fly in a grid pattern to get enough overlapping photos to be able to match them. Um, doing it manually is uh, annoying at best and useless at worst. Um, and so you have to get a, a drone with a GPS unit and a camera and, and, a, and a brain inside it. This one, unfortunately, will not work. It's a little small. Uh, and then you get all these images. You get, you know, 100 to 200,000 images in some cases. Uh, offload them to your computer. And then you have to use this software. Uh, well, you can use a photogrammetry software. Obviously, I'm going to say you should use Open Drone Map because it's open source and I built it. Uh, so here's uh, there's an installation process. There's Three main ways to install it. Uh, if you understand and use Docker, uh, I would say that's the easiest method to get it running. We have a, a, a Docker hub, so you just kind of pull the image and you can run Open Drone Map. Um, that works cross platform. Um, we also, as of uh, this past year, we have a web interface. Uh, it's a deployable server. You can deploy it locally, you can build your own service, uh, do whatever you want with it. It's called WebODM. Uh, and then you can also install it natively on Ubuntu. Uh, and uh, of course, there's a there's a Windows Web ODM ins installer uh, that our one of our contributors uh, and core members of our team has he's built, and uh, it works pretty seamlessly. And then you can, obviously you can find us at opendrummap.org. Um, so if you install it natively, you have to use the command line tool. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, tech barrier to that, um, which is why. Oh, and of course. Uh, We've integrated with Portable OpenStreetMap um, to be using that. I, I don't know too much about that project, um, but I, I know that it's been pretty useful for uh, the team. Uh, and then uh, WebODM, and I'm gonna go through that process real quick, because it's, I think, by far the most user-friendly. 
um, and it has an API. So if you want to build off of it, you want to you, know, you want to hack it, uh, you can do that as well. Um, WebODM is a pretty simple interface. Uh, you create a user account, um, and you can upload the images that you've got. Uh, all the images um, here we've got uh, uh, just a few images, but uh, which you know the more images you have, the the longer it's going to take to process, right? Um, and then it builds this task, uh, and you can save it. You can also specify different options. Uh, if you want to build, uh, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of um, parameters that you can tweak to build a, a, a better data set or a better product out of it. Um, and that's all available in our wiki uh, and on our website. Um, and you just start processing it. And it'll, like I said, it'll build this task and it'll start running. Uh, and it goes through each of those steps that I, I explained before to build each of those products. And the cool thing with WebODM is when it's done, uh, you can actually, you can view the ortho photo and you can view the 3D model online. Uh, so you click view ortho photo and now you can see uh, in a, I believe a leaflet uh, uh, interface on the website, you know, here's, here's your map. And you can look at, you know, how, how accurate is it? How, uh, you know, am I looking at everything right? And, and then you can download it when you're happy, or you can look also at the 3D product. Uh, and uh, this is really cool. You can just you can act, you can look at the 3D product in the browser. Uh, you can sort of scan around it, uh, and both the point cloud you can see here, uh, the textured model. Uh, so what are we looking at in the future for 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 Open Drum Map? Uh, where are we? What, what are we developing next? What are our long-term and near-term goals? Uh, first of all, in the funding, uh, we're funded in time by the Cleveland Metro Parks, uh, as well as uh, through American Red Cross, through the integration with Possum, uh, and then we are three quarters or so of the way through with uh, uh, the Humanitarian Innovation Fund, uh, which we've been doing to uh, make Open Drum Map easier to use, uh, and then make the products from it better and more accurate by improving some of the algorithms and some of the, the processes that we, that we have internally. Uh, where, where do we want to see more improvements? Obviously, we want to get better maps. We want to get more. Uh, we want to expand the boundary of, of, of how, how decent a data set has to be to be able to get processed, for instance, uh, add robustness. Uh, we want to scale up. We want to be able to process 200,000 images, uh, which uh, is simply impossible uh, with the current um, it's, it's just like you need a million gigabytes of memory or something. Uh, and we want to be able to do data partitioning, so chunking out data uh, to be able to process it separately. That goes into the scalability, uh, reducing memory footprint. Uh, and we want to be able to do more analysis, which we're, this is actually where you, we're seeing a lot of changes right now. Uh, automated DTM extraction, uh, doing classification of the point cloud to get ground, non-ground, et cetera. Um, and then doing you know, digital surface model and, and digital elevation models. We currently have uh, uh, both of those digital surface model and di digital elevation model uh, processes in the pipeline. It, like, in, you could run right now and get those, um, but we're, we're working on improving those uh, as we speak, uh, as well as mesh improvements. You saw those meshes, they were a little bulky, they were a little um, blobby, and we, we wanna be able to have like flat surfaces be flat and things like that. Uh, so with DTM extraction, for instance, you've got this, um, this nice point cloud data set uh, and we wanna remove the trees and the building to get uh, an elevation. Uh, and so here's um, some of the processes we've been playing with to get that. Uh, and then we can get this DEM out of it, which is quite nice. Uh, um, let's see, I already went over these. Quality reporting, yeah. Uh, in improving robustness. Um, so we want to add a, a reporting system, and this is in the process. Uh, how accurate are the matches? How many matches? Uh, uh, what are the error rates? Where, et cetera, things like that. Um, improving robustness, so classifying failures, being able to, to find out where it's failing and, and where improvements are needed. Um, and more, obviously having more test data sets is awesome. I'll always need more test data sets. So, and then I'll talk about some of the large scale. How do we get 20,000 images or 200,000 images to, to run um, by breaking it into bite-sized pieces? 
and split a large number of images into smaller groups, run the open SFM, the, the, the structure from motion, reconstruction on each subgroup, and then align all those together into a single, um, a single product or uh, have them all sort of connected through some other, some other means. Uh, so here's an example of that. Uh, I believe this is in Zanzibar. And, and so you can see these are all separate data sets uh, and, and they're massive. Um, I, think, I think this is from 20,000 images. Uh, so this is in the process. This is uh, hopefully by the end of the year we'll have this integrated. Uh, and then uh, other incremental opt optimizations, uh, improving our processor use or improving our memory use through um, a vari various means of uh, optimization. Uh, yeah, so 20,000 images. This is a, so that was yeah. This is a Zanzibar mapping initiative from before. Um, they processed it on a single 32-core machine, uh, all 20,000 of those images, uh, using the, the improved uh, scalability pipeline. Uh, but you could also segment that out and process it on different machines and then put it all together. Um, that's something that we're hoping to have uh, as well, uh, sort of a federated processing uh, pipeline. And then, so yeah, uh, to, to review, oh, with WebODM, we want to integrate all of those things into WebODM as well. Um, being able to display a, an elevation model, uh, do volumetric me measurements, and of course, uh, if we could just control the mission planning itself, that's how you fly the drone uh, from start to finish, then uh, we improve a lot of the data set gathering errors that people run into, just not uh, having enough images or, or not having a, a good enough uh, overlap or something like that. Uh, and then integrating into QGIS would be great as well. Um, so for those massive point cloud data sets, of course, we need something like Entwine and Greyhound um, for, for, for hosting that or, or for viewing that. And then uh, we want to make it really easy. You're happy with your data set with, with that ortho photo and you're on WebODM. Click one, one click or you know, integrate your user account with, with uh, aerial, Open Aerial Map. One click, shoot it up, uh, send it to Open Aerial Map and have that uh, a very easy process to get it up there. So uh, with that, Let's get flying. I hope your ears don't break from this. Okay, good. Uh, any questions? Yes, I was wondering how you how we can use this in OSM. How do we integrate this into our editing workflow right now, particularly with the products that are not just uh, 2D but involving look side angles and stuff like that, which are currently not available from other sources. I would say we're a little far off from getting direct integration or direct involvement with Open uh, Street Map, but with you know, being able to get that into Open Aerial Map or getting those images uh, into uh, humanitarian hands, uh, people who are using Open Drone Map and then doing the digitization work with like Portable Open Street Map, for example. That was also part of one of my questions is, can you handle oblique imagery in your image processing? And a couple of other questions. Yeah, we recommend, uh, an angle, angling the images between seven and 15 degrees for optimal camera position or camera angles for, for matching. Uh, if you can avoid uh, any sky, mm -hmm. so anything sort of with the image below the sky without any sky is probably fine. Right. Um, and as a supplementary to, to nadir or near nadir images, uh, obliques are great. Um, and then next, question is, can you uh, incorporate ground control points, or are you just taking whatever the geotag quality that's in the exit header? Yeah, uh, we can do both, um, or either, rather. Uh, so uh, we do have a ground control uh, process uh, where you can in insert like a, a text file or a CSV or something. Uh, you just have to format it correctly with the, with the pix. You have to go into each image and do the pixel 
Um, in the city that I live in, most of it's controlled airspace, so you can't use drones. But the tool chain and the products that you get from this are still of interest for, for mapping and other reasons. Do you see it possible to use ground level cameras, um, like handheld cameras, with this tool chain, or is it just not going to work? Uh, no, we, we've done some uh, ground level imagery and, and process it with, with, uh, with this pipeline. It, there's some weird issues that happen sometimes. Uh, but yeah, no, you can do ground level imagery. And I think, at least in the US, I don't know about the other, uh, other country laws, but if you have a, a balloon or a kite, uh, there's no, there's little regulation. Obviously check your local laws, I'm not a lawyer. Um, while we're waiting for the drone planning software, what uh, are you using right now for planning these flights with the kind of fixed wing or quad yeah. drones? Yeah, um, so uh, it's generally platform dependent. Uh, it, if you have a, a lot of, there's an open source tool called uh, Mission Planner, uh, which runs with like the PixHawk and Pix4, PX4 uh, um, flight controllers. Uh, and then uh, like, I think DJI has their own and uh, the, the drone you saw here is called the SenseFly EB. Uh, SenseFly comes out with their own mission planning software and, and all of these features of like setting your overlap, those are all included in, in those software that I mentioned. So uh, they generally try to make it pretty easy to, to get the, the, the data you need, that you need. So two questions and maybe this is also cheating, it's maybe sort of a, a question for Nate too. Um, uh, similar to ground level cameras, have you tried this um, this methodology with satellite uh, imagery? Um, is it is it applicable for that? And then um, on the on the 3D and the the DTM and DEM, um, I know you're you're still exploring this, but I would love to be thinking about you know are there ways that that can be made um, available and thinking about um, open aerial map as well. Uh, because that would be extremely valuable for 3D buildings and understanding, you know, f not just footprints, but geometries of buildings mm -hmm. um, and opening up a whole new set of applications. So I'm just curious yeah. um, if that's in, in the plan for open aerial map and how you're thinking about working with them on that. Yeah, um, so for the first question, I've, I've heard on like the GitHub issues queue, people asking about uh, using remote, uh, using satellite imagery and I've never tried it myself. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, and then, uh, so yeah, the digital elevation model, the digital surface models and, and terrain models, those are available in the current master branch uh, of, of Open Drone Map. You can, you can get elevation models from that. Uh, and we're, and uh, yeah, and you can do that also in, in WebODM. So, so that is available to, you'll, you'll get those products out of the, the currently right now is that we're not getting is classified point clouds. Those aren't being saved. So thanks for the talk. Um, so I'm got Mavic uh, and uh, flying in Minsk. So the uh, workflow that we figured out was to like shoot one square kilometer and then uh, you, you know at noon you're going out and uh, shooting a single square kilometer and then you are processing it, and then the next day you are processing the next square kilometer. Uh, so uh, the issue with that is that you, you've you got uh, the edge of the image, mm -hmm. edge of that uh, square kilometer that is duplicated between these two squares, and it's not being reused between the stitches because mm -hmm. uh, for one, it's it doesn't have enough imagery for one, and it doesn't have enough imagery for the second shoot, yes. but for both of them, you've, you've got a great overlap. Uh, is there any plan for incremental uh, updates for the, so we, we want to shoot the whole Minsk, mm -hmm. but it will take uh, a year. Yeah. So uh, is there a plan for incremental update of the single mosaic that you can just uh, throw more photos to Intel? We've talked about it. Um, I, we want to do it. Uh, nothing concrete yet. Um, yeah, I, I think I can't say any more about that. Thanks. I see that there's more questions. I suggest that we take that to um, to the break because we need to um, also make enough time for our for our final speaker of the session. So um, thanks, Dakota.